Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. You're always there, and we just pray that we may understand how to be grateful always. Bless us, Lord, as we continue to learn at your hand. May we not seek to use the flesh, but may we only listen to your spirit. We thank you, Lord, that your plan is perfect. May we understand that we are not to devise our own ways, that we are to just keep reading your word and studying and receiving your spirit. Help us, Lord, to trust whatever you tell us. May we receive spiritual understanding. Bless us today as we look into the lives of other people who've had similar experiences. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I thought we would do something a little bit different today. If you have a little piece of paper, I forgot I can't hear. If you have a little piece of paper <laughs> and you write down a name or two, something you want to get involved with, here's what we're going to do today. God has allowed the biographies of different individuals to be put in the Bible so we can study those people's lives. It's important because as we do, we participate in their life with them. We have the experience with them by faith. So I will invite you today, if you have anybody in particular that you would like to get into their life a little bit more, we'll do that. But I'll need to know who it is you're thinking about. So <laughs> that's why. So I'll give you a minute to think about it. Who... Who would you really like to, to learn more about or something that you didn't quite get when you studied them that you would like to discuss a little bit? Let's see uh, what we come up with today. You didn't do it. They didn't take an offering up today. I told the guy next and I said, they didn't take the offering up today because that's the thing. They didn't know you were down to Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. The whole Bible. you got the whole Bible to work with. Okay. We'll go ahead and start while some of you are thinking about this. The first one we got up here was Job. Let's see uh, what happened in his life. How are they like us, Adventists? Uh oh. <laughs> I think he's talking about the friends. <laughs> All right. I'm going to find some spirit prophecy quotations here and we'll just see. Where the Lord takes us with inspired statements. Testimonies, Volume 3, page 530. Like Job, you should be eyes to the blind and feet to the lame, and you should inquire into the cause which you know not and search it out with the object of you to review their necessities and help just where they most need help. Now she's talking here about what the friends were trying to do. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, they were philosophers and theologians. And that doesn't really help out too much. Let's go back and let's see. What Job is all about. Why did that get in the... Oh, okay. Seems like Job is popular. We got something else here. In the Special Testimonies, February 19th, 1880, there's a little statement there that some people are not aware of. It says, The long years... 
Amid the desert solitudes were not lost. Not only was Moses gaining a preparation for the great work before him, but during this time, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote the book of Genesis and also the book of Job, okay, which would be read with the deepest interest by the people of God until the close of time. So now we know uh, that Moses wrote that, and so Job had to be a, little, a bit before that. But Moses was doing his work. In the Review and Herald, August 30th, 1881, it says, It were well for parents to learn from the man of Oz a lesson of steadfastness and devotion. Job did not neglect his duty to those outside of his household. He was benevolent, kind, thoughtful of the interest of others, and at the same time he labored earnestly for the salvation of his own family. Amid the festivities of his sons and daughters, he trembled lest his children should displease God. As a faithful priest of the household, he offered sacrifices for them individually. I hope you caught that. He knew the offensive character of sin and the thought that his children might forget the divine claims led him to God as an intercessor in their behalf. So when we discussed prayer, we talked about we can pray for other people, but especially our household, we can intercede for them because they're not doing it themselves. Very important. So Job was one of those. Uh, Job's life was uh, Job's uh, life of success and so forth. Uh, let's go to Great Controversy, page 471. It says, those who experience the sanctification of the Bible will manifest a spirit of humility. Well, that's quite a sentence, isn't it? <laughs> will manifest a spirit of humility. Like Moses, they have had a view of the awful majesty of holiness, and they see their own unworthiness in contrast with the purity and exalted perfection of the infinite one. When Job heard the voice of the Lord out of the world, when he exclaimed, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. The sanctification now gaining prominence in the religious world carries with it a spirit of self-exaltation and a disregard for the law of God that marks it as foreign to the religion of the Bible. Its advocates teach that sanctification is an instantaneous work by which through faith alone they attained a perfect holiness. Only believe, say they, and the blessing is yours. No further effort on the part of the receiver is supposed to be required. Now, I wrote something just this morning saying those very things because I'm trying to put together some things that we can put in the hands of some Sunday keepers who may be open. There are very sincere people among the Sunday keeping people, and they've been taught that justification takes care of everything. Well, in a sense, it does. You don't get in with it without justification. <laughs> but once you're in, the question that I ask is, is that all? Is that everything? Because you've been justified. Well, justification is enough for salvation that instant, yes. But if you stay alive, it's not all. <laughs> because God gives you his spirit. And the question is, what does his spirit in a human do? That's what we want to know. Okay, so Job had that experience. Uh, Prophets and Kings 163. And we'll get back to this. The faithful Job, in the day of his affliction and darkness, declared, Let the day perish wherein I was born. <laughs> so, so, if you have ever felt depressed, you're not alone. <laughs> okay, it happens. But we need to know how to handle it. What, we, what God wants us to do with that. God does not take that away from Christians, but he shows them how to deal with it. It says, but though weary of life, Job was not allowed to die. You think of somebody else that happened to? Yeah, Elijah just didn't say he was depressed. He said, I'm no better than my father's. Take away my life. <laughs> he prayed that God would take away his life. And God never answered that prayer. Elijah has never died. 
<laughs> and he never will. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> To him, Job, we're pointed out the possibilities of the future, and there was given him the message of hope, thou shalt be steadfast and shall not fear. From the depths of discouragement and despondency, Job rose to the heights of implicit trust in the mercy and saving power of God. Triumphantly, he declared, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. When Job caught a glimpse of his creator, he abhorred himself and repented in dust and ashes. Then the Lord was able to bless him. Oh. <laughs> then the Lord was able to bless him abundantly and to make his last years the best of his life. Hope and courage are essential to perfect service for God. These are the fruits of faith. Despondency is sinful and unreasonable. For the disheartened, there's a sure remedy. Faith. Prior work. Remember, we pointed out during the prayer cycle that the reason we're praying is so that we can work. That's what it's for. It's for service to others. And that's what Ellen White is telling us here in this little statement. Okay, so, Job, how are they like us? Well, who, which us? The buddies or Job? <laughs> We're supposed to be like Job, aren't we? <laughs> I think we ought to concentrate on that. Now, we are to be helpful to other people, but like I said, I don't believe we're going to be helpful by being theologians to them. When we visit people in their homes, there's a couple things that are very helpful. and You may not think it's much of a big deal, but it's helpful. Tell them that Jesus loves them. That's easy, isn't it? <laughs> but the way you say it is going to make the difference. See? If it's just an idea, uh, nothing's going to come of it. But if they know you know it and you mean it, they're going to pay attention. Now there's a couple things you can do to prove that you know that. You may not be much of a singer, but singing songs with the people opens them right up. Nobody does that to with them. Nobody. <laughs> but if you can have somebody with you, that's why it's good to have two people. Because you can't do everything. If you have somebody with you, you can get the thing started. If somebody in the household can play the piano or knows the songs, that's what they makes it easier. And it has to be nothing professional about it. The words speak for themselves and the singing. It just does something. Then the other thing you can do, it doesn't take any kind of training. Is just open your Bible to something that speaks to you and just read with them a little bit. That's all. Just read. And God will take it from there. <laughs> the, the angels will do something with that. The whole idea is a little word called charm. Not being great and brilliant, not being a theologian or a philosopher, but just simply really believing what you're doing and knowing that God has touched your heart and you can do it in their home. You know, the reason that I know that word is because when I first started doing it, I knew absolutely nothing about theology. Absolutely nothing. And I was knocking from door to door. And when I got in the home, I didn't do so much of the singing, but we would do the reading, and I'd pray with them and just talk to them a little bit. And I would ask them if they wanted to know some more. And usually they would say, well, what does that involve? And I said, well, do you have a Bible? No, do we have a Bible? Well, I'll get you one, <laughs> okay? And I'll tell you what, you can keep it if you go a couple times with me and we go through some things. <laughs> it's yours. And they would say, okay, we'll do that. And I didn't tell them we might get involved in some studies. I just said it a couple times. <laughs> 
But after a couple of times, you can just ask them, would you like to know more about this? And then if they say yes, you're in. See? But, but by that time, you're a friend. And they're not thinking about you as somebody from a church trying to get them to join your church. You're a friend that's helping them out. See? And that's where the charm comes in. God wants us to charm people. He doesn't want us to hit them over the head with the truth. <laughs> That's what Job's friends started to do to Job because Job didn't understand what everything they were saying. He didn't agree with everything they were saying and he began to hit back. See? <laughs> he said, wait a minute, you're saying I'm a big sinner and that's why God's doing this to me. No, I'm not a big sinner. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, he was a big sinner, but it wasn't God doing that to him either. He turned Satan loose so he could prove who Job was. So if God can trust us enough to turn the devil loose on us, is that a blessing or something bad? We're bound to count it as a bad deal. <laughs> But God is blessing us by saying, look, I really trust you, and I know that you're not going to let it go. That's quite a thing for God to trust us. Okay, maybe we can weave some more of this in as we go through here. I'll read some more about Job because there's another question here. Well, there are no specifics. Let me get to see if I can find it here. Yeah, in this compilation, there's nothing specific about Elihu, one of the friends. Um, if you have a more specific question about life, I would like to have that. Then we can deal with it. Okay, this is, this is very general. Okay, anybody have another name we could deal with? Okay. You have one? Okay, that's a good one. <laughs> you mean in this compilation? <laughs> this compilation is about the major characters in the Bible. Uh, Elihu is certainly mentioned. But uh, there, would, uh, there are no specific things just for him here. He's mentioned, I'm sure, in the Spirit of Prophecy in passing. Uh, let me see here. Well, I didn't notice this isn't set up the way it could have been. Let's see, you have Simon here. I've got to find the right Simon. There are several Simons in the Bible. <laughs> Simon, the little known. That's not the one you want. Do you have a Bible reference that I'll know which Simon you're dealing with? OK. 
Okay, that'd be helpful. Yeah, I forgot the, the names are used several times here, some of them. Oh, the Cyrenian. Okay. I don't think he's in here either. That's another small one. All right. You're talking about the fellow that they laid the cross on? Oh, okay. All right. There's not a lot known about him. The Spirit Prophecy doesn't talk much about him except that he was saved through having the cross laid on him. Now, there are different theories about what they laid on him. We won't get into all of that. I believe that they actually took it from Jesus and put it on this Cyrenian. He was the father of someone who knew Jesus intimately. And when he came through town there, he didn't know anything that was happening. And when they pulled him out of the crowd because he was showing sympathy... <laughs> He was surprised. He wasn't sure what was happening. What they, when they put it on him, he didn't want to do it at first probably. But uh, then he looked at Jesus and the Baromans just said, you're doing it. That's all there is to it. When he was carrying that cross, the Spirit was working with him. And of course the events have followed. He put it together. But uh, as far as his background, I don't think we have very much background anywhere in the Bible or the Spirit Prophecy, so we just kind of have to let that go by. Now, we can look at his character, and let's notice a couple things. Let's say that you're Simon, and you're coming into town that day, and you see the crowd, and you don't know what's happening, and the Romans start pulling you and shoving you around. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. You know, these are things we may get to taste a little bit because there are some fellows wandering around with masks now with holes in there. And if you pay taxes, you're paying them. I'm not talking about terrorists wandering around the field. I'm talking about law enforcers in our country who don't show their faces anymore. That's kind of an interesting thing. <laughs> I'm sure they have some pretty good reasons in their mind why they do it that way. If uh, somebody took a shot of them on television and put their picture all over the world and they attacked the wrong person, then you can identify them very easily, see? And I'm sure they, they're not too happy about being seen by everybody. <laughs> so I can see that there is some justification for that. But the other side of a card says nobody knows who they are. <laughs> so if they do something wrong, there's no way to figure out how to get some recourse on that. So there are always these two sides. And we're entering an age where it's really difficult to balance these things out. Well... Simon didn't have a choice. When the Romans got a hold of him, nobody bucked the Romans. You got the sword next if you didn't pay attention. So he got pulled. Now you're Simon now, and you've been pulled. And it's the Romans. They've got you, and they put this cross on you. Well, what are crosses for? Who gets on them? Only the worst criminals. And now they're asking you, a civilian, from out of nowhere, to take the load for this criminal. <laughs> Does that make you feel better about what you're doing now? <laughs> this is getting worse all the time. <laughs> and they take him, and of course, when they put Jesus on the cross, there's a hole in that rock and they just don't gently place it in there they throw the cross up and it, it hits and he's hanging from it it pulls on him and he's in the middle of the other two which means he's the worst one you're still Simon and you're beginning to pick up the story you have been asked to help the worst one 
So things are stacking up. I guess you're feeling happy about any of this so far. But then later that day, things begin to happen, and you're really noticing what's going on. The first thing you noticed, of course, was when they hammered the nails in his hands, that he didn't scream. Sweat started coming out of his face and his pores. Yeah, he was in pain. But the only thing that came out of him was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that got his attention, I'm sure. He never saw a man like that before. And from there, he began to look at things a different way. And he began to notice things. And I'm sure he stayed in the crowd to see what was going on. And he was close by. And of course, after the whole thing is over, he realized what he had done. The Spirit showed him that he actually gave comfort to the Son of God. Out of all the humans on earth, it was him. <laughs> so I'm sure he was a faithful follower the rest of his life. We don't get a lot about him, but we can pick up little traces of things that he went through that can show us some of the experience he must have had. And I'm glad you asked about him because I never would have thought about Simon as friend because there's very little. <laughs> it's a hard thing to, to find anything written on him. But uh, he was a human, just like you, me. His experiences kept him. And no doubt we will meet him in heaven because they pulled him out of the crowd like that. And it wasn't the devil that did that. God converted him that way. <laughs> we don't always get converted the easy way. Yeah. As a matter of fact, many people in the Adventist church still need to be converted. It's still coming. And so the first time wasn't good enough. It was too easy just to say, oh, I believe that. Well, let's see if you believe that. <laughs> There's an interesting little statement from prophecy. It says that God waits for the excitement to wear down. <laughs> yeah. It gives us some time. <laughs> And then we'll see what we believe. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, somebody have something else we can work with here. We got lots of names in here. Okay, Jonah, let's try him first. Let's see what's happening with Jonah. That's a familiar one, so... Uh, we may find some good things here. About 800 B.C., Okay. He was the first prophet that the Bible records going to a heathen nation. <laughs> okay. Jonah. The word Jonah means a dove. What did Jesus say about doves? Wise as snakes, harmless as doves. Yeah. Okay. Is that Jonah? <laughs> Let's see, he was named a long time before to do the right thing. <laughs> Nineveh, what was Nineveh? Do you have a picture of Nineveh? It, it, it was one of the biggest places inside of a wall at that time. And the Ninevites were famous. Whenever they left the walls, everybody went hiding. These were some mean people. <laughs> they were so mean that after they went through a town, and they were little towns back then. We're not talking about cities like we have today. Just little towns that you could put inside of walls and protect yourself from enemies by throwing rocks at them down there. Little towns. But whenever they went through a town, 
they left something at the gate on the outside to let people know they had been there. It was a pile of heads. Yeah, they cut off their heads. And <laughs> that's the Ninevites. And they had lots of little tricks like that. And so when Jonah said, uh, God said to Jonah, I'm going to send you to Nineveh. <laughs> Jonah knew who those people were. <laughs> uh, what did he say? No, what? <laughs> I know about them. What are you trying to do? <laughs> All right, so let's see here. Nineveh. Prophets and Kings, page 266. Nineveh, wicked though it had become, was not wholly given over to evil. He who beholdeth all the sons of men and seeth every precious thing perceived in that city many who were reaching out for something better. And who, if granted opportunity to learn of the living God, would put away their evil deeds and worship him. So even in that place, <laughs> God saw. And so he had to send somebody to them. Now, somebody asked a question before about heathen. Well, here it is. There's somebody there who's been listening to the Spirit talk to them. They want something. They want more. And God's going to send somebody to them. See? That's the way God still works today. There's somebody out there who doesn't know anything about God. All they know is what TV says, what the movies say, and what false preachers say. And they want something better. Well, God has to send somebody to them. And so God picked a Jonah here. The son of Amatil, the Bible says. God said, go, arise, and go to Nineveh. Well, I don't know where Nineveh is today. But I have an idea, because I was in California for a while. And for a while, I was in the upper central part. And if God had said, you go to Market Street today in San Francisco, <laughs> Now, you may not know what's on Market Street in San Francisco. But they're marching in Portland for rights. They say, marry us. We want all the rights. That's what, what's on Market Street. That's where all of this started in this country in a big way. And you can't hardly walk around there without getting germs all over yourself. I have a feeling that's the way Jonah was feeling. And his skin began to crawl. You want me to go to Nineveh? <laughs> God said, yeah, there are some there that we need to talk to. Now, what this statement doesn't say, and I don't know that the spirit policy gets into it, but as you go further into the study of that time, there was one king among the Ninevites who was different than the rest of them, historically. And I have idea, an idea, he was there at this time that even he was open, this king. Well, what happened to Jonah? Jonah's a good one to understand because I think Jonah is a type of Seventh-day Adventist. You're picking in some interesting names here so far. <laughs> yes. Now, why did I say that? I better clear that up first before we go further into this. When God came to us the first time, we probably didn't know very much about anything. When he came to us, it just sounded good. The Spirit was opening us up, and we saw the logic of it. It was clear. And once we saw the package, we said, where else can you go? <laughs> There's nobody that talks like this. This, is, this has to be from God. And so you said, that's it. That's God's church. I want to join that. And so God gave you some time. See? Now, when he called Jonah, Jonah said, no. He was honest about it. He said, no way. 
So he got on a boat and he went the other way. <laughs> now remember, this is a prophet of God. This is not an ordinary citizen. This is a prophet of God. <laughs> and he's headed that way. And so God fixed up a fish. And Jonah got swallowed by the fish. Because when the captain looked around at this big storm they were in, he said, I've never seen anything like this, not around here. Somebody's doing something on this ship causing the problem. <laughs> and he says, who is it? What's going on here? And he says, is it you? No. Is it you? No. Who are you? What do you do? No, 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 no. When he got to Jonah, he says, who are you? I'm a prophet of God. Oh, okay, that's all right. Uh, well, why don't you pray? <laughs> well, it won't do any good. He said, why not? God doesn't listen to disobedient prophets. Oh, <laughs> you're a disobedient prophet? <laughs> yeah. Are you causing the problem? <laughs> What are we supposed to do with you? <laughs> so he got pitched out and the fish is waiting and the fish took him down. And God did not stop the digestive juices. And Jonah was in there for three days, it says. And he said he called it forever. He said, I was behind the bars forever, the ribs. I was be I was in there forever. Well, forever was three days. You remind a person who says, oh, they're going to burn in hell forever. What, you mean three days? And they're going to say, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, forever is three days for Jonah. All right, forever is some, a lifetime for somebody else. But forever is not forever. So when Jonah was spit out, and I can really look at that, I'd see it happening because I have two little dogs. One's getting bigger every day. And I've taught both of them that when we go for walks, you know, dogs always, they're fast. Boom, they got something in their mouth. <laughs> you cannot stop them from picking it up, but you can tell them to spit it out. And they both know when I say spit it out, they go and out. <laughs> and now they even know when I stop, they're spitting it out. I don't have to say anything anymore. <laughs> and I can see the fish coming up to that shore. There comes Jonah, half-eaten, bleached-out skin because he's been in there with those digestive juices, and he's coming out with whatever else was in that fish uh, all over himself. I think he got the attention of the Ninevites when he walked into town. <laughs> yeah. Now, Jonah didn't get there by himself the second time, did he? He had a lot of help from God to decide to do the right thing. <laughs> yeah. He didn't wait for Jonah to figure it out. <laughs> he didn't wait for Jonah to say, well, you know, I think I ought to obey God now. No, God set a series of events in there where he saw, you know, it really is a good thing to obey God. We think we better get this done the way he says. And let's see where the blessing is. Well, the second chapter of Jonah begins with these words. And God came to Jonah the second time. That's why I think he was a Seventh-day Adventist. Because God has to come to all Seventh-day Adventists the second time to make it work. <laughs> is it true or isn't it? Did you get it all the first time? <laughs> You never went down. Nothing went wrong. Now, God comes the second time. And that second time holds. I'm thankful for the story of Jonah. He shows us a seventh day of Adventist experience that we shouldn't be doing, but it happens. So. <laughs> I'm glad to know the second time works. He got into that town. Bible says that he, it's a, a day's walk through that town. That's a pretty big town. A day's walk through that town. 
Well, you know the story of Jonah. He preached. And all the time he was preaching, he was saying, <laughs> these no good people, you know, you're going to get punished. You're going to get punished. Oh, the fire is going to come down. Here comes the tar. Here comes, oh boy, are you people going to get it. <laughs> and the king and the whole town. Now, of course, all of them were sincere, but Jonah got through. The Spirit got through, and the ones God wanted to reach were reached. And that town said, well, who is this God you're talking about? We want to know more. <laughs> and Jonah said, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> he left town. Yeah, he left town. He got up there on that little hill looking down at it. They said, come on, God, I told him you were going to bring down fire. Where's the fire? <laughs> I told him you were going to get him. Come on. <laughs> You're making a fool out of me. Are there any Seventh-day Adventists like that? I don't know. I hope not. You're making a fool out of me, God. You converted him. <laughs> And we know about the gourd. So God put shade. A gourd. That's what the shade was. The gourd plant grew up. And they shaded him. And Job said, well, at least I'm comfortable here waiting for the fire. And of course, we know the gourd plant didn't last very long. God shriveled it up. <laughs> and now, Job is complaining. I mean, Jonah is complaining. They said, come on now, you made me a plant and the thing's gone now. It's hot out here. God said, are you complaining about a plant? How come you don't complain about all the people in the city that I just saved? <laughs> and Jonah wasn't getting this at all about who God is, and yet he's a prophet. Yeah. So don't feel bad if there are some confusing things in the Bible. <laughs> okay? There are lots of things we're going to have to work our way through. There are some things we're not going to understand at all until Jesus comes back. Prophets and Kings, page 267. The prayers of the man who had turned aside from the path of duty brought no help. See? He knew that. No. Prophets and Kings, 271. You might want to read 270 also. There's some good comments on that page. 271, it says, When Jonah learned of God's purpose to spare the city, that notwithstanding its wickedness had been led to repent in sackcloth and ashes, he should have been the first to rejoice <laughs> because of God's amazing grace. But instead, he allowed his mind to dwell upon the possibility of his being regarded as a false prophet. <laughs> Jealous of his reputation, he lost sight of the infinitely greater value of the souls in that wretched city. Is it that something? Now I want to remind you of something Jesus said about this. He went to the leaders of his church. And he said, you know, they only had Jonah's talking to them, and they repented. You have me standing in front of you. Those people are going to judge you. <laughs> oh! So who is the, the more wicked? Ninevites or people today who won't listen to Christ? 
There's a big story there about Jonah and those Ninevites. <laughs> There's more. It's a beautiful thing to look at, to understand. But let's go on here. Noah, a very important story. We need to understand some of the important elements of Noah. The reason I say that is because one night, a Methodist preacher came to one of the meetings. And somebody came up to me and whispered to me and said, that's a Methodist preacher that just walked in. So I said, well, now I'm going to have to fine-tune this a little bit. <laughs> so, so that meeting was for him that night. My mind was totally turned in that direction to see what do you do with a Methodist minister. And I went to Noah. And he thought he knew the story of Noah, but that night he heard things he had never understood before. And let's try to get into that just a little bit here. He became a Seventh-day Adventist. That night he came up to me afterwards. He says, I want to tell you how much I appreciated this meeting. You were not talking denominationalism. It was straight Bible, and Bible like is not being taught today. Yeah, he became a Seventh-day Adventist. Noah, very powerful. Uh, God knows all history, doesn't he? Don't let anybody take that away from you. We have people within the framework of Adventist scholarship today who think that there is a real possibility that God doesn't see everything to make it a fair contest. Yeah, you can go to the ABC right now and probably pick up a book called The Openness of God, written by one of our men. And that's what it teaches. God doesn't see everything in the future. Well, there's so many holes in that, I don't want to get into the subject all by itself. But I want you to know that you should have a firmly in your mind reasons why you know God can see everything. Don't just think it. How could God bring Lazarus back from, the, from death if he didn't know it was going to turn out okay? That would really be playing around with his life, wouldn't it? To bring him back to mess up? No, God knew it's all right to bring him back. Why should God raise anybody if he didn't know how it was going to turn out? Just that one fact is enough. God has to know the future. Well, a hundred years before the flood came to this world, God told Noah to preach because there's a flood coming. <laughs> God knows the future. <laughs> he knows how all things turn out. There's no problem. So Noah preached for uh, over a hundred years. And, of course, he was building a boat at the same time. And people hadn't seen boats like that before because there was no reason for it. There were no oceans. <laughs> yeah, there were bodies of water here and there, little lakes and things. But there were no oceans. Why, what are you going to build a thing like that for? Well, he told them what for. There's going to be a flood. Well, how are you going to get this flood now? What, what's the flood? <laughs> They've never seen a flood. <laughs> there was no such thing as a flood. He said, "Well, it's going to come down from the sky, from the sky." Well, how does that work? That's never happened before. The Earth at that time had a canopy around it <laughs> of, of water, vapor. And it equalized the temperature everywhere and made nice humidity. And it did lots of things. It kept out rays. It kept people healthy. And it had always been intact. Nobody knew there was any other way for it to be. And so when Noah said, it's, we're going to have water coming down on the sky, they said, well, wait a minute. You're just a lunatic preacher. We're going to go ask the scientists. And so they went to the scientists who knew everything. 
And they asked them, is, is water going to come down from the sky and we're going to have water every place on the earth? And they said, well, it's not possible. It's against the laws of nature. It has never happened. And because it has never happened, it never will. Uniformitarian principle. As things are, they will always be. <laughs> I think science is still talking like that today. So he made the mistake of going to the scientists to find out if what God was saying is right. But then they made another mistake because he kept preaching and teaching and building that boat. And every hammer blow was a judgment against them. That's what every Sabbath is on this earth today. Every Sabbath is a judgment against this world. Every Sabbath. Every Sabbath. Well, as the time approached, the people wanted to see how this was going to work out. And just to be sure, they went to the preachers, the church. And they asked the preachers, is God going to destroy this world like that fanatic over there saying? Well, children, you can settle this in your minds. Right here and now, forever, God is love. He would never do that. <laughs> he would never judge the world like that. So there you have it. The scientists and the preachers all agree Noah's a nut. And so the people were starting to enjoy him now. This is a funny man. Let's go hear him. And they pitched their tents and they made a nice little, you know, not too long ago, the Cinco de Mayo here. I went driving by the bridge there. Where is that? That way. And, uh, <laughs> and I saw all oh, those tents. That's very impressive. That's about what it looked like around the boat that Noah was building. All these tents all around, people sitting around with their guitars, playing, having a picnic. They're having a good time. They thought, well, this is great. This gives us something to do. We'll watch this fellow do this, and we'll all get together and have a good time. And so that's what they did. But then one day, the animals started coming from someplace. And not just straggling in, they were coming in an organized way, by twos, by sevens, pairs, and one extra one. That's what seven is. That's one extra one. Why an extra one? It was the clean animals that came in by sevens. That means you have to have an extra one of those to do sacrifice with. Right? That was a sacrificial animal. So the animals were going into the, the boat, and the people said, what's doing that? <laughs> Nobody is telling them to do that. They're just doing it. What is causing that? So they went back to the scientists. The scientists tell us about that. Well, that is a phenomenon that happens about every 2,000 years. Well, the animals get together. There's a conflux of magnetism, and they end up at this place. <laughs> and I said, oh, good. We wanted to hear that. But they were sure, so they went to the preachers, and they said, well, watch out. He's doing some magic tricks now. <laughs> you watch out for that magic stuff. Well, the animals all got in there. Noah called his family, the eight souls we've talked about. And once they were all inside, an angel shut the door. Now, that's very important. And an angel shut the door. God is in control of this whole thing. No man. And when the door shut, the people really got excited. They said, now we know he didn't have a motor in there to shut that door. What shut the door? So they went running back to the church. And the church said, don't worry. Don't worry. It's just a trick. Day one went by. This is the part that started getting into that Methodist minister. Day one went by and nothing happened. The sun set, same thing, the stars are out there, everything going on. Huh. 
Day two. Nothing. Day three. Still nothing. Day four. And the people are starting to get mad. They said, Noah, you scared us. We're going to get you when you come out. So they said, we're going to wait for you. So they sat out there. Day five. They said, and they're getting madder and madder, boy, this way. Day seven. On the eighth day, something began to happen, and they didn't know what it was. The earth began to rumble. Because he didn't tell them everything. There's water in the earth. <laughs> And the sky began to look funny. And all of a sudden, things began to break up in the sky and in the earth. And spots came out of the earth. Volcanic action was forcing water up. Water was coming from the earth and water was coming from the top. There was a deluge. And the church went running to the boat and said, Laura, let us in, let us in. Open that door. We have voted. We had a board meeting and we want to go in. <laughs> Open the door. And of course, what could Noah say? He said, well, I didn't shut the door. <laughs> I didn't shut the door. Well, we know what happened with the animals, the big animals. He said, we know about big animals. We're not saying they weren't big animals. We've never said there were no big animals. We just said they all died in that flood. People tied their children to the animals because the animals were strong and they would last the longest. But when it was all over, there was just eight people in that boat. Now, the question in this story is this. Why did it take seven days? This is uh, the number seven is everywhere you go in the Bible. That ought to mean something. The number seven is always there. God's pulling our attention to it. On day one, what was different about day one than any other day in history? The door had been shut. What? It's one day after the door was shut. The second day after the door was shut. The third day after the door was shut. So when you get to when something happened that they could see, how long had they been dead already? That Methodist minister had never heard that before. And he sat there and was stunned. The judgment occurs before the people know anything has happened. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. People on this earth will be dead for days before they know anything has happened. says the plague's come in a year. I don't think that means it's going to take a year. They come sometime within the framework of a year, which could be five months. So this planet will be dead for at least five months before Jesus comes back. And people will be marrying and going to school and doing all the things they do all during that time, except for one thing, where the plagues are falling. Yeah. The plagues are going to cut some of that short. So the story of Noah is a very, very important thing. The conditions of the world in the days of the Noah are the same conditions that are going to be in the world before Jesus comes. And we are there. We have all the things that the people in Noah's time had. 
One of the, one of the things that is mentioned is about marriage in Noah's time. It doesn't say sacred marriages. They said they're just getting married. Just getting married. 16 times, 20 times. They're just getting married. And marriage means nothing. That's one of the signs. Marriage has gone by the board. And that's exactly what we're getting today. Marriage that means anything is being legislated out of existence. Well, I won't say any more because it's a tremendous thing, this study about Noah. I should say one more thing. The people who were helping him build the boat, many of those died before the flood came. Methuselah himself died the year of the flood. <laughs> and all the people who died before the flood came could die in faith. <laughs> and they would be saved. So we can't say only eight souls were saved in that time. <coughs> there may be many, many souls, but they were only saved after the flood through that. Eight souls through the waters. <coughs> By the way, the word Methuselah, the word, this is name, in the Hebrew means, then it will come. When he dies, then it will come. <laughs> now, if God doesn't know everything, how did he do that? Name this man that way, and that's the year the flood came. <laughs> There's, uh, there are a couple more things hiding there, of course. The devil is not in control. He just is not in control. When this happened to this world, it was such an event with everything being torn up that the whole human race died. Satan himself was told by God, you're going to stay there with it. Be right in the middle of it. And Satan could not get away. And he thought he was going to be destroyed right then with the flood. It was a horrible catastrophe. That's in Patriarchs. Patriarchs and Prophets. Page 99, it says, Satan himself, who was compelled to remain in the midst of the warring elements, feared for his own existence. Page 99, Page Arts of Prophet. No longer sheltered from us. Yeah, all of that's gone now. That's why cancer started that. Cancer is the result of meat-eating, and not handling the rays that now come through unfiltered to this planet. You know, God protected those people before in different ways. It was a different world then. People lived almost a thousand years. After the flood, Abraham is 175 years. And after that, down to 40 years. And now in the United States, it's back up. Well, now we're not the healthiest nation anymore. We're only number six now. <laughs> we're killing ourselves sitting in front of the TV sets eating. Yeah. The fast food places. The fast death places. You know, we shouldn't pride ourselves in our health message. We shouldn't do that. Because if you want to study statistics, the Mormons live a little bit longer than we do. Yeah. Mormons, I'll say. They have a health message, too. And they seem to be living at a little bit better than we are. 
A strange thing, isn't it? But the point is that if we were to live what God said, there'd be nobody on this planet that lives like Seventh-day Adventists. Nobody. I should say another thing here. I just started to zero in on Noah. It's tremendous. We don't have time to really go into too much more, I guess. The bow. The way the colors are set up from ultraviolet to infrared. The shape of it. The way it comes. You see, science says, oh, we know all about the rainbow. It has nothing mystical about it. It's just, just pure optics and moisture and we can explain it all well i don't know that they can explain it all the symbols are there so god could make it clear to us that the bow of promise is based on two things drops of water and sunshine and together you get the beauty of the promise. See, tears and sun. You get the promise. The one thing that stymied me for many years, and just recently I was looking at the rainbows. There's lots of them around here. <laughs> you see that shape, and where does it go? Well, you never see the whole thing. You just see that <laughs> you don't see. And I got to thinking about that. I've gone underneath as many as five of those at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Driving across Nevada one day, that happened to me. Five of them, all at the same time. But it always bothered me. They don't get to see part of it. What's going on? I know there's no more because there's the ground. But, but what is this supposed to mean? And then one day it just hit me. Well, I'm supposed to understand I'm looking at this thing with my limited eyeballs. I'm just seeing what's visibly there. It's not half a rainbow. It's the whole thing covering the earth. That's what I'm supposed to be seeing, that God's grace covers the earth. He's made a promise. He will never destroy the earth again that way. And so the rainbow is actually a whole circle. By faith, we can see that circle. And that helped me understand the throne of God because that bow is there. I used to think about it as this little arch. No, there's a circle there, see? <laughs> it's green. All right. Uh, one quick one, one last one here. You have another one here. Uh, we'll try to... See what that's all about. Joshua. Oh, I had something else in my mind here. Let's see here. 153. Okay, Joshua was a young man when all this started with Moses. And, and who was Moses? Let's stop there for a second. Here was a man so powerful. They were going to make him Pharaoh. The top man on earth. That's not bad for an orphan. <laughs> they were going to turn him into Pharaoh because they saw right away who he was. Anything he put his hand to. Just like that, it was easy. They put him in the army. He knew everything about generalship right away. A general. They put him into diplomacy. He knew everything about diplomacy. They put him in a place where he could work with some art objects. Most fantastic artists they ever saw. He was an architect. He was a poet. I mean, there wasn't anything he couldn't do. What a tremendous person. And then God told him, well, I'm going to make you the leader of my people. 
so he could even do that. <laughs> Except that when he went out to lead, the first thing he did was kill an Egyptian, and that wasn't exactly what God had in mind. So he told him, you know, I have to get this out of you. You're not paying attention. <laughs> I told you you were going to be the leader, but you do what I say, not what you think. Now, is there a lesson in that or isn't there? You do what I say, not what you think. He <laughs> said, so I have to get this out of you or you're going to be a problem to me. <laughs> so what did he do with it? <laughs> they put him out there with those sheep. Now, I haven't been around sheep very much, but I'm sure glad. <laughs> those creatures just do not get it. <laughs> <laughs> they need help even to sit down so that's what he, he did with them he said here you deal with this for 40 years <laughs> it took 40 years to get that out of Moses to show him he was nothing do you have 40 years left I don't either. <laughs> but he's got to show us. We've got nothing to say about this. We're nothing. And we better believe it. It took Moses 40 years to get it. And then for the next 40 years, God had to show him what he can do with nothing. <laughs> so he was something. Then he was nothing. And then God had to show him what he can do with nothing. After all of that, this brilliant man, the Israelites knowing who he was, seeing that he talked to God face to face, now he says, Joshua, you take over. <laughs> You're Joshua. <laughs> Who's going to follow a man like that? <laughs> Joshua? I have to tell you a funny little thing about Joshua. It says his father was none. N -U -N. You don't know how many people have come to me and asked me, how could he have no father? I said, what do you mean? Oh, he's a son of none. <laughs> That's really happened. <laughs> <laughs> the son of man. Well, okay. Joshua was a very quiet person. Yeah. Very quiet and unpretending person. I mean, this is not the person you tap and say, now you're going to follow Moses. You're going to lead these people. These stubborn, hard people. <laughs> a million and a half of them. <laughs> Always hollering at you. Always saying, Oh, you're trying to kill us. <laughs> That's hard. You know, we have to think about these poor people in the Bible that we just rattle off their names. They were just as human as we are. And they thought the same kind of thoughts. Like, who can do this? Well, of course, we know that he finally got over there to the country to, to look it over. Caleb was his buddy. And there were 12 of them, and the 12 came back. And the 10 were carrying this big cluster of grapes. <laughs> Now, I don't know how big they were, but, you know, that much water weighs a bunch. <laughs> so they were walking back, and they got back, and they said, well, look at the, look what's in that land. And people said, oh, fantastic. Yeah, so, but the people are like that, too. <laughs> we're never going to get over there. Caleb and Joshua, of course, said, well, wait a minute. God said it's ours. He's given it to us. What difference does it make what's over there? It's ours. We get to move into their houses. They just have to move out. Easy. <laughs> and you know what those ten did? They picked up rocks. <laughs> 
and they were going to take care of Caleb and Joshua right there. They said, you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> yeah, they were going to stone him. And God came into the picture then and says, wait a minute here. <laughs> Those are my men. And they're the only ones going in there. Those two. Out of a million and a half church people. Now I'm going to ask you a question that I have asked every person who's out there trying to say this church is Babylon and trying to educate people on how to do things their way because the church is in apostasy. I want to ask you, is two people who are faithful out of a million and a half is that apostasy or not? A million and a half church people died in apostasy. That sounds to me like a lot of apostasy. I don't think we had those ratios in the Adventist church yet. It was still God's church for those two people. And this is the question I've asked every one of these people out there doing what they're doing. Are we down to two people yet? Because until we get there, this is the church of God. I have never had any of them say something about that. Now, I have a lot of sympathy for people who are mistaken, honestly, and they think they're doing what's right. But once they're shown something and they see it, it's not honesty anymore. There's something else going on. God is able, and he took a Joshua and he proved it. <laughs> Just like he could take any one of us here. And if we will listen to him, he will do what he says to get the movement through. Joshua turned out to be a fantastic individual. NASA has tried to deal with the problem that was introduced during Joshua's time. He needed a little bit more time out there. And God said, how much time do you need? <laughs> and God said, well, we'll deal with time. And you know, people think that God is in time in a certain way. But he proved it right here that he does with time what he wants to do. They said, well, for you, we're just, it's easy. We'll just make the sun stand still. <laughs> no problem you've got your time go ahead <laughs> what can God do can he keep me from sinning <laughs> you can't get him He's not going to do it by magic. That's what some people are teaching, that he does it by magic. He has a formula, he speaks, boop, you don't sin anymore. No, he doesn't do it by magic. He does it by cooperation, by the power of the blood that we talked about. He does it by Jesus. But if we don't want it, he's never going to force us. God does not force people. He puts it in front of them and he says, this is what I say, this is what I mean, this is what I'm going to do. Are you with me? Oh, you can't keep me from sinning. Why not? I'm too big a problem for you. <laughs> do you see the pride? I'm too big a problem for you to handle. Oh, you can make the sun stand still. Okay. <laughs> But me! <laughs> we really get stupid, don't we? <laughs> we don't make sense so much of the time. We've got to listen to God. And Joshua did that. The sun stood still. And NASA figured out there's about 10 minutes I can't account for. Well, there's more than 10 minutes. <laughs> but they think they haven't figured out. Time. Something has happened to it for that little portion of time. No. When Joshua 
was nearing the close of his life, he took up a review of the past for two reasons. To lead the Israel of God to gratitude for the marked manifestation of God's presence in all their travels, and to lead them to humility of mind under a sense of their unjust murmurings and repinings and their neglect to follow out the revealed will of God. He showed them that desolation would be the result of their departing from God, and as God was faithful to His promise, He would also be faithful in executing His, his threatening. All right, so he said, choose. That's all. Just choose. Yeah. Well, there are a lot more things about Joshua, too. There's fantastic things going on there. All of these people, if we just get in and not just read the words, but try to figure out, what would I do if I was sitting there and I was him right there? And see what kind of feeling tones you get out of it. See what kind of reactions you would have. See what God did. See what they did. See how it worked out historically. Yeah, these things would mean something then. Then we can know when something hits us. Well, you know, I went through that with Joshua. What happened there? <laughs> it will help us. Okay, thank you. Those were some good names to deal with. There's a whole bunch. We'll do this again sometime. You might be thinking about that and uh, having the back of your head something you might want to get into. Okay, I don't know that there's anything interfering with a meeting here next week particularly, so we just count on, on there being a meeting here. Okay, that's our problem. Father, we thank you. You're always there. You never fail. We have no idea the equipment that you have. We can only trust that whatever you say, that's what you can do. And not only is it a possibility, but you will do it if we will cooperate. We thank you for these stories in the Bible of real people, of experiences they went through. Not all of them turned out well, but we know one thing. Your will is always the safest place. We thank you, Lord, that all this has been preserved for us. May we take time to read, to study, to meditate, to make decisions in our own life of how we want to do things. Bless us, Lord. We're all learning. We're in the sanctification path. Help us to realize that you see the end from the beginning and you have already seen the victory. Help us, Lord, to count on that victory with you. In Jesus' precious name.